will ensure that the treatment is probabilistically independent of the, the background level, alpha, for the unit, as well as beta, and the other causal factors, W. So that's, that's what the point of random assignment is. And if you assume that, it's trivially that the effect size is just really depends on I mean, of course, if there's no, uh, the treatment and control have different values here, so the effect size just depends on the average of beta. So if, if, the, um, if that means if the effect, if this is non-zero, then this term has really got to be there in the equation. Right? You can't possibly get a non-zero value here unless T really does figure in the equation equation, the causal principle governing the production of the outcome in the study population. So that's what you can conclude uh, from finding a positive effect size. If you find a positive effect size, okay, then that shows that T really appears, that this treatment that's under test really does appear positively in the, um, in the <coughs> causal principle that governs the production of the effect. The causal principle that governs the production of the effect in the study population. Of course, any place that that same causal principle holds, uh, you, found out, so you found out something about the pop, that <coughs> causal principle, but it's a particular causal principle you found out about. What you know is the causal principle that holds there in the study population um, has T in it. Okay, so, um, here's what the RCT argument looks like. Um, if you um, were to start to write it out, um, the study satisfies, uh, I shouldn't have used alpha, beta, and gamma because alpha and beta were parameters in that equation, <laughs> but the study satisfies a bunch of conditions, um, including, in particular, this one that, random, that you've got uh, T probabilistically independent of alpha, beta, and W. So T satisfies a number of conditions, the study satisfies a number of conditions, the effect size is positive in the study, therefore T plays a cause, positive causal role in the study. Um, and all that means, I, I use the shorthand, T plays a cause, positive causal role in the principle governing the study. Um, that's just shorthand for um, T's there in the causal principle, and moreover in the study, um, the average value of beta was greater than zero. So that's the RCT argument. Um, so we have a good argument, RCT, got, it's a valid argument that has among its premises the evidence claim we were interested in, and then it has as its conclusion, this one I keep going on about, that T plays a positive causal role under the principles governing the production of O there in the study. Now to establish the evidential relevance of the study results to the prediction <coughs> we're interested in, that, sorry, the prediction we're interested in, uh, that the, is to establish E's evidential relevance to the prediction we're interested in, which is that um, T will play a positive causal role here, if we implement it, um, we need another argument, which is the effective NARS argument, in which H, in which this conclusion figures essentially as a premise, and our, our prediction that T's going to work for us uh, appears as a conclusion. I seem to have left out the mention uh, that this argument here, uh, I thought I had a slide on this, it might turn up later. This argument here that I said is uh, mirrors things that uh, you see in by uh, Holland and Rubin and you also see by economists. It relies on Pat's probabilistic theory of causality. I don't write it out that way, but uh, if Pat's probabilistic theory of causality is not a correct account of causality. It doesn't make a correct um, connection between probabilities and causes, then this <coughs> argument is no good too. This, this argument fails. So um, in order to make the, the kind of connection between causality and um, effect size that you see in a randomized control trial, you better be supposing uh, that Pat's got it right about the probabilistic <laughs> theory of causality. So now, here we are back at um, uh, my claim that what I want to do is to um, now talk a bit about this effectiveness argument, which itself is um, 
very simple. Okay. Um, the first thing to do is to look at the simple linear form. Um, it's got this bead in it, and the formulation can be misleading. And I see that it sometimes is in the hands of some of my fellow philosophers who treat beta as a constant. Um, but beta is not a constant. Um, remember the philosophical slogan that causes our inus conditions, insufficient but necessary parts of unnecessary but sufficient conditions uh, for contributions to outcomes. Um, if you don't know the expression, don't worry about it, <laughs> because what's important about it at this stage is simply that almost anything we pick out as a cause or anything that we pick out as a treatment is not sufficient on its own to produce the effect in question. Um, that generally the things we designate as the treatments are operate as part of a team in cooperation with a whole set of helping factors. This is true no matter how fully and how carefully you try to write out the protocol for the treatment, that you just can't get everything in. So um, the things we name as treatments, the things we call causes, are parts of um, parts of a larger team uh, that it takes, and it takes all the members of the team to have the right values in order to get the um, in order to get the outcome. Uh, and that's, um, these are represented in one swell foop by uh, the beta there. Uh, okay, maybe here's where. So, um, if the, oopsie. Okay. So, if the um, effect size is greater than zero um, in a population, in a study, that shows that the average of beta is greater than zero in that population. Remember back here, that's what we actually had in the, um, in the conclusion there. It's the average value of beta. If the effect size is positive, the average value of beta is greater than zero. And beta represents, in one fell swoop, the, all the values of all the arrangements of the helping factors. So if you get a positive effect size, that shows that the average of beta is greater than zero. And I guess here's where I mentioned Pat. <laughs> Uh, it's, if you recall the probabilistic theory of causality, it looks for probabilistic dependence between T and O in different subpopulations that are characterized in our notation by different values of beta. So Pat's got the idea of prima facie causality when T, when, uh, T and O are probabilistically dependent on each other, but it's only real causation if that the probabilistic dependence continues to hold once you've uh, partitioned on the, uh, all the other uh, causal factors, and that co those combinations of the other causal factors are represented here by uh, beta. Well, they're represented by beta and W, but W is dropped out of the equation. Okay. So what we learn is that T plays a positive causal role here, that T principles governing O, and that there's a good distribution of helping factors here. Um, so right, if, uh, if, if beta, if the average value of beta is zero, or the average value of beta is negative, you're going to get a zero effect size or a negative effect size. So all I mean by a, a good distribution is that if you're, if you're interested in getting a positive effect size, what you need to have is a distribution of the betas that will be just the right ones to produce, allow the treatment to, to do its job. Okay. Now, one of the things that's important to note is that when we're talking about the distribution of these helping factors, they're the, the helping factors that are necessary here for the treatment to work. And one of the things, particularly since I've been working on social policies, um, there are lots and lots of social policies that are effective in different places, but that the causal principles are just slightly different in the different places, so it takes different helping factors in the different locations in order for the, uh, the policy to produce a, a good effect. Okay. So here's the effectiveness argument. Um, T appears in the causal principles governing O in the study. Oh, I know what's happened. 
Oh, sorry. I've been waiting. Uh, I've been waiting for another slide. Um, this doesn't have the Harris Cooper homework, does it? No. Okay. Um, I sent a later uh, version of the uh, of these uh, that had uh, has an example. I, you probably all got the idea of helping factors, but um, one of the uh, they're often they're often graphed. Epidemiologists graph them in what they call um, causal pies. So you have a graph of the causal pie, and it will have the salient factor, the treatment you're interested in, as one slice in the pie, but then they'll picture all the other factors that are necessary to be in place along with the salient cause um, as the other slices in the pie. And so I've got um, a case uh, that's easy from the, the work of Harris Cooper on homework. And one of the things we know about homework is it doesn't always work. Uh, and it's not just a matter of, uh, there, there are reasons why it doesn't work. In order for homework to be effective and to produce the kind of results, that the, the level of results we expect, uh, you need to have a supportive family environment, uh, <coughs> to teacher feedback, etc. Uh, there are various different supporting factors that co homework can be combined with uh, to make it effective, but it's not going to be effective on its own. So you need, uh, you need uh, these helping factors, and when you do a randomized controlled trial, what you're seeing uh, in the effect size in the study population is the average value over the distribution of those background helping factors. And some of the helping factors, of course, and often in many cases, um, can be negative. I mean, it can be that you've got uh, some factors that the treatment combines with and gives you uh, negative outcomes. Uh, for instance, if the, uh, if the children are uh, rebellious and resentful, uh, signing homework can actually reduce uh, the, their, their scores. So uh, what you're seeing when you see a positive effect size is, again, the average over these helping factors. And um, if you see um, a positive effect size, that means you've got a good distribution. <laughs> the ones that the, the positive uh, pies uh, outweigh the effects of the negative ones. If you get a negative uh, effect size, uh, it's the other way around. And if you get a zero effect size, it could be that the treatment isn't effective at all, just you know, it's not there in the equation, or that the negative and positive effects are balancing out. So here's the effectiveness argument that I want to couple with the RCT argument. We've got as a premise uh, that we've learned from the RCT that, uh, that T appears in the causal principles governing the outcome of the study. Um, now, <laughs> this is the simplest possible argument. Right? <laughs> um, what makes that relevant? To here, so we know it plays a role, causal role in the, in, in, in the causal principles there. Why, why is that possibly relevant to what happens here? Well, if you assume that if it appears in the principles there, it will appear in the principles here, it suddenly becomes relevant. And moreover, you need to know that the support factors necessary for T to contribute here actually obtain here. In fact, what you need to know if you want a positive effect size is that you have a good distribution of them. So um, you know, it's not just that they obtain in some individuals uh, or other. It has to be that you have a good distribution. That is, there are uh, the, the, uh, the contributions from the, uh, the, the good ones outweigh those of the bad ones. You don't need, in order to think that it's going to play